mention how privileged we are to be a part of this denomination who, who loves you so much, who loves each other, who holds up your word, who has a passion to reach the nations, who has a passion to, to teach your word, to come together in unity, the vision they have of reaching cities, the Fifth, fifth Act plant in, in New York. We pray that you continue to guide those leaders in our denomination to give them a clear picture of where you want us to go, what you want us to do, how you want us to serve, how you want us to give. Continue to raise up leaders, continue to raise up those who honor you and want to see your name glorified everywhere. God, remind us of who we are. As Keith just said, that we are adopted into your family. We're a family. You are our Father. Christ is our true elder brother who freely gives, allows us to be inheritors of the kingdom of God. How incredible that is, God. We're so thankful. We're an imperfect family, but we're a family. And we look to you. Our greatest thought every day is you. As we go to your word, teach us, open our minds and our hearts to you. Make us more like your son. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we're going to be reading Galatians 2, 17 through 21. And I know uh, last week, just a brief overview of last week, we saw how Paul had to openly confront Peter because Peter made the hypocritical um, action of relapsing back into law. He started separating himself from the Gentiles because he saw that the Jews were coming who believed in circumcision and he was falling back into law, thinking again, oh, I need to do what I can to obey the law, to, to be on board with those who believe in circumcision in order to not cause strife there. He relapsed back into law. And Paul had to openly rebuke him, remind him that we are, we are saved by grace. We're no longer under law. We've died to the law. And he reminds Peter, he reminds the Galatian churches that he's writing to, and he reminds us that we are justified, that we are declared innocent because of Christ, that we are justified, just as if I never sinned because of the finished work of Christ, that we no longer have to be slaves of the law. So he reminded us of that. And today we're going to be reading verses 17 to 21. So let's read that together. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For if I, through the law, die to the law, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. So let's, <clears throat> let's break this apart, starting in verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners. Is Christ, therefore, a minister of sin? Is he a promoter of sin? Paul's answering a question even before it's asked him. He knows. He sees it coming. And it goes like this. Premise one. You can go to the next slide. Premise one would be, you say, you say that Christ declares you innocent. Right? He sees the argument coming this way. People would say, you see Christ declares you innocent. Premise two. You're still a sinner. Conclusion. Therefore, Christ must be a promoter of sin. He must be a servant of sin. You say you're declared innocent. However, you're still sinning. Peter, you're still making mistakes here, relapsing into law. Therefore, Christ must be a minister of sin. He sees the argument coming and he answers it immediately. He says, Meganoito. That's the strongest negation in the Greek. God forbid. No. Because we sin does not mean that Christ is a promoter of sin. Christians are not perfect. We know that we're not perfect. 
Any genuine believer knows that we still fall short of the glory of God. 1 John 1.8, if we say that we are without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And although we know that we sin, we know that believers sin, what we like to tend to do is make heroes out of people. And so even Peter, early, you know, the chief of the apostles, we, we tend to make him into a hero. We, we tend to do this with people. Put them on pedestals, try to immortalize them, make heroes. I want to respectfully show you some examples of the type of people that we tend to make heroes out of, and then to remind us that they are not heroes. We are not heroes. There are no heroes. So first of all, maybe we know him, he's Martin Luther, or Lutheran Church. Did a lot of great things, Reformation. Um, and I want to respectfully show you just some examples of why he's not a hero, nor are any one of the type of people that we tend to put on a pedestal. So Martin Luther was, had some issues with being anti-Semitic. Next slide. John, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. He plagiarized in college. A.W. Tozer, oh, sorry, John Calvin. John Calvin uh, had people killed if they disagreed with his theology. Next person, we have A.W. Tozer. Um, A.W. Tozer on his, on his deathbed told his wife uh, that he didn't have any money for her, that he recommended that she marry a rich person in the church in order to be able to survive. And she was so frustrated and angry at him that she abandoned the Tozer, the Tozer name to provide. Next we have Billy Sunday. Great preacher, not so great of a father. Uh, wasn't really there for his kids. He had three sons, they had a total of nine wives. Wasn't great role as a father. And next, uh, Tully and Chivijan. And this uh, kind of hits closer to home for me because I really, I still respect this man very much. Um, and unfortunately, a week ago, he had an affair on his wife. It's the, the grandson of Billy Graham, excellent preacher, really understands grace, but he's not a hero. He can't immortalize anyone. He made a mistake like, like believers do, he still sins. We did this with biblical characters, with David. He committed adultery. He had someone killed. He murdered someone. Joseph. Joseph was a, a huge a brat to his brothers. Jacob deceived his brother to get his birthright. In a moment of weakness, traded it for a, a bowl of soup to get his birthright. And then he tricked his dad by getting his blessing instead of his brother. He was a deceiver. This is one of the forefathers of the faith. Samson, a womanizer. We could go on and on and on and on of mistakes that have been made to show, to remind us, we are not the heroes. They were not the heroes. We do this with athletes. Michael Jordan, what a hero. You know. Tiger Woods. We do this with Hollywood actors and actresses. We immortalize them. But Jim Cimbala said this, preacher in New York, he said, the closer you get to any man of God, the more you realize that God uses him not because or her, not because of who he or her is, but because, uh, but despite of who they are. The closer you get to any man of God, you realize that God uses them not because of who they are, but despite of who they are. But we like to, to put people on pedestals. We like to immortalize people. We even make superheroes. Just bear with me a second. We even make superheroes. I don't know why they put Spider-Man at the front. He should probably be at the back. <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll, give you, I'll give you two two examples here. They should put like Thor in the front or something. Anyways, um, two examples here: Superman and Batman. First, Superman. You know, we more or less make superheroes, and it's fun to do this. You know, he can he can fly, he beats up bad guys, he can shoot laser out of his eyes, defends justice. <laughs> Incredible strength, right? Can lift anything. Batman, not as good, but a lot of people like Batman. <laughs> Batman, okay. Defender of justice, um, hates wickedness, fights bad guys, defends the weak, the powerless. 
Batman, we like to make superheroes. The problem is, there are no superheroes. They're not real. There are no heroes. They're not real. There are no heroes. There are no heroes except God. Only Jesus. Only Jesus is a hero. The one who, it says in Revelation, has eyes like flames of fire. Who sent down fire from heaven to protect Elijah and consume the false prophets of Baal. The one who set a bush ablaze, yet kept it from being consumed just to get Moses' attention. The one who walked in the fire in order to protect Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They pointed and said, a man like the Son of God is in the fire with them, protecting them. The one who has real immeasurable strength and power. The one who can actually fully and completely defend the poor, the powerless, the weak. The one who loves justice, hates wickedness, and will perfectly judge the world in righteousness. He's the one we can count on. And we're about to discover, as we look through these verses, why Christians can say they have this hero, not only with us, but living in us. But before that, let's, let's look at verse 18. Verse 18. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. He's saying, look, it's not that God makes us sin. He's, notice the I. If I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a a transgressor. So every time a Christian starts building again those things which were destroyed by the power of Christ, by the power of the cross, the resurrection, new life, the hope that we have because of the finished work of Christ, every time you or I, what Peter was doing, building again those things which were destroyed, we sin. When we start relying on, counting on our own ability, our actions, we make ourselves a transgressor. And how many ways do we do this? You know, we say, ah, look at, we start building our own resume. We say, we say, God, I mean, I, I pray, I go to church, I fast, I do community service, I recycle, I donate blood, sorry, lawns, um, I, I don't know, I floss, I, I, do, all, I do all these great things. I give money to people in need. I do the star 99 one thing where I pay for the person behind me their coffee. You know, I do, I do all these great, this is why I should be accepted. This is why I'm okay. This is why I'm a morally upright, okay person with God. We do this in a million different ways. We say, here you go, God. This is why I'm, I'm okay. But God says, to come to me, you got to die. you got to humble yourself. you got to realize that there really is nothing that you can do to be right with me, apart from looking to and having faith in the one true hero, Jesus Christ. Our righteousness is like filthy rags in the sight and we try to earn the salvation. We have to die. Verse 19 says, For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. And in this famous verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to read to you a little intro that a man named Octavius Winslow wrote. It's from the 1800s, so please excuse the old English language if I mess up a word or something. But he had a little commentary in verse 20, and it goes like this. He says, intellectually and theoretically, people may accept the Bible to a certain degree as true, guarding their unbelief by the admission that, if not wholly inspired, there is at least inspiration in it, and thus far excellence, it is the most wonderful volume existent, as a book of history and philosophy of poetry and ethics. As a book of history and philosophy of poetry and ethics, it is the most wonderful volume existent, but is it nothing more? Alas, what multitudes there are, the fruitful offspring of this age, of broad theory and speculative thought, who thus accept the Bible as a textbook only without the slightest knowledge or profound conviction of its being holy and only the Word of God, whose great revealed truth is Christ our life. Enamored by the casket 
They see not the divine jewel that it contains. Admiring the frame, they are oblivious of the marvelous picture it encases. Fascinated, as we've remarked, with the Bible as a book profoundly philosophical, sublimely poetical, and divinely ethical, they are spiritually and willfully blind to him to whom the scriptures testify as the light and the life of men, who has emphatically declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is with spiritual life, then, that we are concerned. It will be acknowledged that life in its every form is a marvelous and a beauteous thing. There is, in reality, no place where life is not. There was never a time when life was not, and there will never be a period when life will cease to be. But, passing by all other forms of existence, our thoughts are now concentrated upon the divinest, most sublime, and holiest of all life, the life of God in the soul of man. Christ in me. We have to break this verse down into a couple parts in verse 20. It starts with, I have been crucified with Christ. Obviously, none of us here have been physically crucified. You wouldn't be, you wouldn't be sitting there. I wouldn't be up here talking. We haven't been physically crucified. So what does he mean? God so identifies us with Jesus that it's as if we were crucified with him on the cross. As it says in Romans 6, 5 through 7, if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, so we also will be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who died has been freed from sin. He so identifies us with Christ that it's as if we were crucified with him. Our old man was crucified with Christ. Our sinfulness that we were once slaves to. We can celebrate our own funerals because we see that we not only died with him, but we will be resurrected like he was. We share in his resurrection, as it says in 1 John 3, we do not yet know what we will be, what we will be like, but we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. To be crucified can mean three things. According to this one commentary, I put it this way. It said, to be crucified can mean three things. First of all, you're facing one direction. Secondly, there's no plan B. There's no turning back. And thirdly, you have no further plans of your own. Holy and fully submitted to God. Look what it says next in verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. There's a bunch of verses throughout the Bible that make it clear that God is not only with us, but he's in us. Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you. Hebrews 13.21, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12.6, God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does this work in all of us. Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's more than with us, he's in us. We really are the, the temple of the Holy Spirit now. He's in us. And the end of verse 20, and the life which I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We're saved by faith and we live by faith. We can know that when we die, not only that when we die we're going to be with Christ, but we can have faith and believe that even now he is with us, he is in us, he's working in and through us. Listen to this. If, we, if, if he loved us enough to die for us, and you can believe that he loves us enough to live out his life in and through us. And I know that I need to hear that over and over and over again. If he loved me enough to die for him, then he loves me enough to live his life in and through me, that he will accomplish his purposes in my life because of him, not because of me, because of his, his power, because of his presence in me, in my life. And the last verse 21. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. If there was any other way to be right with God, 
And he made the biggest mistake in the universe by having to come here and having to take on the sins of the world upon himself. If there was any other way, then he made, then he made a huge mistake. But there was no other way. We do not set aside this grace, this free gift of God, because there's no other way. Practical question. Does, does Christ live in you? And one of the commentaries put it this way. It said, human nature does a lot of things. So one of the ways that you can have assurance, does Christ live in you? Is we look at human nature. Human nature does a lot of things, but it does not prompt the anxious question, what must I do to be saved? Have you asked that? Human nature does not Scream the agonizing prayer, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Human nature doesn't do that. Human nature does not ask, Lord, you know that I love you. Human nature doesn't do that. Human nature can go so far, but it can go no further. People without Christ don't want Christ. People don't want a master. They don't want someone to be fully accountable to they would not want to pray this prayer at the end of Psalm 139 that says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Can you sincerely and honestly want to pray that today? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting? If you do, that's a good indicator that Christ lives in you, that you've been born again, that you have a relationship with the true and living God. But even if you can pray that, we're still in the midst of the war, even though it's been won. We're still in a battle. We're still fighting the world, the flesh, and the devil. But because of his life in us, we have the ability to overcome sin. It's this living and loving union, the moment-by-moment -moment dependence of the life in Christ in us that gives us the ability to overcome sin. Sin has been cut at the root. We've been united with him in the likeness of his death and in the likeness of his resurrection. His power in us severs the root of sin and gives us the ability through dependence on him to overcome sin and to accomplish his purpose in our life. We went from a war that we could never win to a war that we cannot lose. The moment that you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you went from a war that you could never win to a war that you cannot lose because we have a hero living in us. Let's pray.